Unstuck in Time, Memoir of a Time Traveler by Carol Louie. In this episode, we'll look at Chapter 4, I Remember Marco Antonio. His fingers strummed the wooden table, caressing the ridges of the boards, then slid across the well-oiled wood. The sensations of the wood conjured up an image of the craftsman who made the table. Such a frivolous thing to do under the circumstances, but somehow it instilled a sense of solace. The Inquisitor's fist pounded and brought him back from the momentary peace. The crowd stirred with anticipation that built up to a crescendo after a long day of interrogations on what would turn out to be the last day of his testimony. Archbishop Marco Antonio de Dominius was about to testify again. Bodies stretched in their seats to see the heretic decked in his full regalia, his head held high. How would he answer the questions put before him? Would he continue to be outspoken, or would he acquiesce and be a puppet for Pope Urban VIII? Marco Antonio scratched his chin, an old habit whenever he was nervous. Even though he felt nothing he said or did would offend God. Indeed, He felt it was God who guided him. Why me, God, he thought to himself. I know that I am right, but they shall stand together in their lies, and I shall die. Is truth worth death? Could I live with myself? Should I lie? No. I must speak my truth. As he faced the tribunal, he knew his fate was sealed, but he answered each question as meticulously as he could, trying not to offend and yet speaking clearly to the issues, his differences with the church leaders prior to going to England, his desire to unite the Catholic Church and the Church of England and the Greek Orthodox Church and the role of theology in scientific endeavors. The words seemed to come as if in slow motion as he answered their questions. He knew the danger and sheer audacity to question the church's authority, but how could he ignore what he perceived as truth? How could he not question that another interpretation must be considered, knowing the weight of the empirical evidence, and in needing to question, how could he not wonder about a system that held fast to obvious fallacies. It was all he could do to tamp down his feelings of anger and self-righteous indignation. He wondered, would Jesus deny science? Wouldn't Jesus want the churches to be as one? While there was truth in what Marco Antonio said, it was the way he said it that had rubbed the others the wrong way. Was he blind to the ultimate goals driven by his ego's desire to prove himself? Even though he was on the right track, he was a flawed human being after all. He was his own worst enemy. Marco had rallied all his strength for the Inquisition meeting, and as soon as he was alone, he felt exhausted and sought comfort in his chamber at Castel St. Angelo. A rap on the door gave him a sudden burst of energy, knowing he must complete one more task. Franco, his assistant, entered. The Lord be with you. And also with you, said Marco Antonio extending his ring. He searched for the envelope containing a letter to Galileo among the papers scattered on his writing table. You must get this message to Galileo immediately. 
Time is of the essence. Handing the envelope to Franco, he fell back in his chair, resting his head against the carved frame. He felt as if a weight had been removed. But, but, irritated, he snapped. Do you question me? This is a matter of life and death. He paused, feeling angry at himself for his short temper, but he realized that a habit of a lifetime is not easily changed. I'm sorry. I'm tired. But you must find a way. Yes, Archbishop, I understand, he said. Marco Antonio slipped a few large coins wrapped in a handkerchief into his hands. Thank you, my friend. This means so much to me. I will find a way to repay you in another life, for I fear I do not have much time left in this one. Don't speak such nonsense. You will recuperate. You always do, Franco said. There, he said to himself, remembering seeing Galileo at the trial. Now if I die tonight, at least I know that I have done something worthwhile. With that, he felt more relaxed than he had in months. He knew it would not be long now, but he could go in peace, knowing he had done as much as he could to make amends, to help another human being with his life purpose. Could it be his duty was to help Galileo? He hoped Galileo would understand his meaning that a shift was just beginning. I must concentrate on another life with Galileo, or even something better. Mesmerized by the orange and yellow flames dancing in the fireplace, while reflecting on his life, he knew how useless it had been to try to make others believe as he did. He saw all the mistakes he had made by trying to push his beliefs onto others. He saw his arrogance and self-centeredness that had motivated him for much of his life, even as he rose through the ranks of the hierarchy. He felt ashamed for thinking he had all the answers. What had seemed so clear was now like a muddy stream flowing toward the river with all the silt churned up by the rush of the water coursing from the snowy mountains. Marco Antonio remembered how in his discontent with trying to change the minds within the Catholic Church, he smugly left and turned his attention toward England. Starting over, fate moved him along in the direction of leadership in the Church of England under King James I. But old patterns got him into trouble again. His self-righteousness did not serve him well in England. It eventually sent him packing, returning to Italy in 1622, like a dog with his tail between his legs growling all the way. However, on the journey home, Marco had time to reflect on what he really wanted to do with his life, since he was failing in the religious circles. Ideas came to him as he read the writings of Copernicus and Galileo. As a mathematician and a man of science, he appreciated their findings and wanted to do some research of his own. It would be good to focus on other endeavors and let the others deal with the politics of religion. Moonlight shining through the window pulled him just as he believed it pulled the tides. But to what shore? He knew he would pour his heart into scientific research, but could he possibly find a way to connect the heart of the church with the mind of science? When he searched the libraries for something to validate his discoveries, he found origin of Alexandria's papers about the concept of salvation as a reunion of all souls with God through man's free will. This was the piece he was looking for to reform the church, 
albeit not in the way he had expected, but it came too late. He knew that battle was already lost, but Origen's writings gave him a world view he had not explored before. Did Origen support the idea of reincarnation? Sounds from the street invaded his peace and quiet as he laid in bed, but he knew it no longer mattered. He clutched the blanket to his cheek like a baby and felt his life force wisping away. His last thought was not about the heights he had achieved in his profession. Instead, it was a longing to know what part of him escaped his body. A warm hand touched his shoulder. His spirit moved forward with who he supposed was an angel, although he had never seen an angel before. The glow around the angel's body gave a golden backlighting effect that seemed to radiate a feeling of peace. His eyes were the bluest blue he had ever seen. His face seemed familiar. He was beautiful, graceful, and yet unassuming. The man was dressed in a burgundy velvet hooded robe tied with a golden rope belt with a bundle attached at the waist. Matching burgundy velvet slippers with golden embroidery peeked out from the hem. Looking back at his body lying curled up in the blankets on the bed, Marco Antonio felt more alive than when he existed in his shell. The angel extended his hand as if to say, Come with me. As Marco Antonio stepped across the threshold, he felt a sense of adventure. I wonder if Father Origen will be here to answer my questions. So many questions. No matter. Marco Antonio was sure he would find someone to help him understand his ponderings. He looked at his hands, then searched to find a mirror. He noticed his hands were no longer wrinkled. As he moved about the room, he realized it felt familiar to him, and he remembered where his silver hand mirror was. A younger face with a full head of hair stared back at him. He moved over to the writing table and picked up a paper. When he stared at the paper, he saw words in his handwriting that filled the page. There is more to life than what we can see, and I want to know as much about this process we call life as I can. I feel the energy of life calling to me like a siren on a distant shore, and I am resolved to find her, even if it takes a thousand lifetimes. He held the paper as if it were gold. Like a lucid dream, he remembered writing those words day before, then wadding the paper and burning it in the fireplace. He remembered his final days, satisfied that he did the best he could in the end. It was not a smug feeling, but one of relief. Now he was ready to move on to whatever was next, even though he did not know what to expect. Opening his mind to the possibility and hope of another life shifted everything within him. A warm glow radiated around Marco Antonio and permeated his room with a feeling of love that he had not experienced in his life. Marco Antonio felt as if he were coming home. A knock at the door startled him. Enter, he called out. Good day. Did you rest well? His angel greeted him. Would you like to go out and explore? Indeed, Marco Antonio said, although he did not remember sleeping. He was so excited by his body and surroundings and the letter that he lost track of time. Time. What is time? He asked his angel. He called Christopher. That is a good question. As you may have gathered, 
time is very different here, as are many things one takes for granted on earth. You are going to like our library and research centers, as well as our cafes, where you can explore and talk to others who are as, I'm searching for the right word, ah, yes, as motivated as you are. Others? For the first time, he considered what it would be like to share his thoughts and questions with others who did not condemn him for his inquisitive mind. Yes, let's go to these places. I'm ready. I'm more than ready. Good. Let us go to the plaza and I will introduce you to some folks. In fact, you will more than likely remember several they have been waiting for you to return and give a full report. Marco Antonio grabbed Christopher's arm. Waiting for me? He said, surprised. But of course, they're part of your soul group. Good, this is good. I was not close to anyone, he said, as a longing to be with others filled him with joy. The old feeling of aloneness from his earthly life dissipated when he heard laughter as he entered the plaza and joined a group sitting at tables bunched together. He recognized the pattern on the tile of the tabletops and the fresco that adorned the wall. The colors were fresh as if newly painted. Christopher, Marco, come join us. We've been expecting you. Marco Antonio smelled the rich aroma of the coffee and freshly baked pastries. He seemed to recognize faces, voices, gestures, and eagerly joined in the conversations. How? Where? Where do I know these people? He thought as he tipped his head to greet them while trying to appear composed. Has it sunk in yet? An aristocratic woman asked, bending over the person sitting between them, her bosom billowing over the bodice, jiggling with every breath. Marco Antonio breathed a deep sigh in through his flared nostrils, then out through pierced lips. Indeed, was all he could muster. Christopher came to the rescue. It's time to go. We have a meeting to attend now, but we will return shortly, if you'll excuse us. So formal, Christopher. We know where you're going. Good luck, Marco. You'll do fine, the busty woman said. Christopher caught Marco's elbow and, without looking back, said, This way, pointing to a building that looked like the University of of Padua. Where are we going? What kind of meeting? Do I need to prepare, he said. You've been preparing all your life for this meeting. It is meant to be spontaneous, Christopher said, and there is nothing to be afraid of. This part is not exactly like earth. The room was well lit, but Marco Antonio could not determine the light source. Light had always fascinated him, not just the sun's light, but also moonlight and the colored lights of the rainbow. The room was unlike any he remembered at Padua. In fact, he had never seen a room quite like it in all his travels. Its Spartan atmosphere and unadorned furnishings were a sharp contrast to what he was accustomed to, but he welcomed the serenity he felt as he stepped into the room and took his place at the large round table. The walls were bare, as was the floor. No paintings, tapestries, or rugs. Three men sat at a round table of a design he did not recognize. They invited Marco and Christopher to join them. All three men wore white cotton robes and somber expressions. He had a feeling this conversation would be nothing like the one at the plaza. The person to his left waved his hand and the lights dimmed. Marco Antonio wondered 
where the beautiful lighting came from without a chandelier or sconce in sight. An image appeared on the walls and on the ceiling above them. At first he saw a scene of the night sky. In fact, it was the night when he and Galileo sketched the moon. A sense of wonder bounced between them. This is where it began, he said out loud. So many new discoveries were happening, and we had an overwhelming knowing that this was the beginning. We were determined to record our findings in as much detail as possible to make it easier for the next fellow who followed in our wake. We called our notes the maps, sensing we were pioneers charting new territory. The strange and wonderful thing was that we often did not know what the next steps would be. How we would get there or where we would end up. But we were steadfastly sure that we were on the right track. Other scenes magically appeared a moment after Marco Antonio thought about them. They flashed one after another, milestones in his life. However, the images slowed down as he remembered writing the letters to make amends. Feelings of compassion rushed in now at the memory even as they did when he feverishly wrote his letters. Those moments of submission and surrender touched his heart and he could not contain his tears. Marco felt closer to something greater than himself, a feeling that outweighed all the honors he had ever received. Then he put two and two together, those familiar faces at the plaza and the people he had harmed along the way. What was it Christopher said about his soul group? The scene that surrounded them suddenly morphed into the conversation at the plaza. Marco Antonio blushed. How is this possible? He said, looking around the room. This is marvelous, simply miraculous. Christopher leaned over and said, It is wonderful, isn't it? When we evolve, maybe we will be able to create the scenes. Evolve? Marco Antonio said. The room faded to black as if the scenes dissipated into thin air, and then white light rose from what was the floor and filled the space that was no longer a room. Light in every direction. Marco and the others were no longer bodies, but dots of light in a sea of light, fully aware of one another, and yet also aware of the connection of all beings. The overriding feeling was love, unlike anything he had ever known before. I remember love, he whispered. Instantly the room disappeared, as did Christopher and the others. Marco touched his arms, his chest, his face. He scratched his beard. What just happened, he said. You opened yourself to love, Marco even if just for a moment, Christopher said. I have never experienced anything like that in my life, Marco continued. Maybe not in your recent life, but what you have experienced, even if ever so briefly, is where you originated before you began your incarnations on earth, Christopher said. I did not want to leave. I'm still reeling. Take your time. We can even take a break. Sometimes it's good to go for a walk in the gardens. Yes, I would like that. I would like that very much. Marco barely remembered his death, and now he had witnessed so much more than he ever dreamed possible. I feel it is important to pay attention and observe in a way I have never done before, he said looking at the flower of life design in the center of the garden. It is as if there is a purpose to everything. Even for ordinary things we take for granted. 
Christopher was right. Marco did enjoy his time in the libraries and research centers. As much as he learned, he knew that he had to go back to apply those ideas in another life. New ideas came to him about what he would like to do in his next life. There were so many options. Would you like an interesting challenge, Christopher said one day as they strolled through the garden's labyrinth. I think you will like this idea the elders proposed. They believe you are ready for it, even though it will not be without its trials and tribulations. What do the elders have in mind, Marco said, eager to know the elders' proposal. They believe you are ready to experience parallel lives. In one, you would be a man who rises to fame, and in the other, you would be a woman where women are not revered. You will have an opportunity to see what you will do with power again, as well as to know what it is like to be less powerful. There will be many challenges. Of course, it will be up to you what you do as you face each obstacle. Just as he was beginning to understand many aspects about reincarnation, the elder's proposal was beyond his imagination. Is this possible? Marco said. Now Christopher and the elders pulled a rug out from under him, but he did not hesitate. Holding Christopher's shoulders, he said, Why not? I think it is a challenge I cannot refuse. When do I start? <laughs>